All right, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? We are now live with Jed Michaela, the co-founder of, uh, of Ripple, the co-founder of Stellar, and the creator of Mount Gox. Jed, thanks so much for being with us here today. I know how busy you are. And with your new startup, Lightyear, we really appreciate you taking the time to be here and to teach us today about your experiences building on the blockchain. So thank you yeah. so much for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Great, thanks. So, you know, we, we're very privileged to have someone of your accomplishments here, and there's a lot of hungry engineers in the audience who would love to learn from your experiences building on the blockchain. And so maybe we can start off by just telling us a little bit about yourself and your background, and how you got started in life, how you learned how to code, how you learned about the blockchain, what inspired you to get into this whole industry. Maybe you could start from there. Sure, yeah. Um, let's see, I've been programming since about third grade. Um, once I learned you could make video games, that a person could make them, uh, I just got super excited and started trying to do that. Um, I've been in distributed systems for a long time. One of my early projects that people were interested in was called eDonkey 2000, which was a file sharing system, which is like a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and I've always been interested in kind of uh, democratizing um, like sources of power, like like limiting um, sources of power. Um, and so like the file sharing was kind of an effort to do that. But when I learned about uh, Bitcoin in 2010, I got super excited because this was like a much... Um, a much more visceral and powerful way to do that, right? So, um, yeah, so I got I got super into Bitcoin um, and just kind of uh, as an attempt to kind of learn the system, I created Mt. Gox, the, that exchange. It got pretty popular. Uh, I, I sold it to this guy in Japan who unfortunately was pretty incompetent and, and tanked it. Uh, and I was always, after that, I was kind of thinking of other ways to improve, uh, to, 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 because what Bitcoin showed is that you can have this public ledger out there in the world that everyone can see, but no one can change arbitrarily, which is a really powerful idea. But the mining process always kind of bothered me because it's like super inefficient um, and extremely wasteful. Um, and so I was trying to think of other ways to solve the consensus problem and kind of came up with the idea uh, leading uh, that led to Ripple. Uh, and after that, then I came up, like had further tweaks on it, um, working with Professor David Mazaris uh, and, and we created Stellar. So, um, so that's kind of where that's kind of the path to today. Thanks for that, Jed. And, uh, and tell me uh, your vision for Stellar when you originally created Stellar. What was the vision for wh where that project would go and, and what it would encompass? So uh, the basic idea is that um, like as part of this uh, blockchain journey, I guess, I kind of uh, realized how broken the financial uh payment systems are of today. And uh, it's, it's sort of an attempt to fix that, right? So the, basically the way money moves around the planet now is like very much pre-internet. Um, there's all these different payment networks like ACH here, SEPA in Europe, there's mobile money things like in PESA, uh, and there's like things like PayPal, and none of these things interoperate, right? And uh, and Stellar is a way to be this uh, like internet level protocol that combines these things, that, that, that is a common language for these things to, to send value from like one network to another. Um, and that, that's the basic idea. So, um, you know, like if, if, if the thing about these blockchains, they all kind of get lumped together, but they're all kind of solving different, pretty different use cases. Like Bitcoin's trying to be a new currency. Ethereum's trying to be this like distributed compute thing. Uh, and Stellar is trying to be this like uh, new like internet level protocol for payments, right? They're all they're all pretty actually different. So, very nice. And uh, and tell us a little bit about the Stellar consensus algorithm that you created. What is that algorithm? And, and maybe you can start off by just talking about what is consensus, just to make sure that everyone's on the same page in our audience. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, so this is a really old problem in, in computer science: is how do you have like if you have different servers running in like different places in the world. How do you get them all to agree on a common value, right? Like, say you have a, a database that's replicated in two places, but you want them to be in sync. So when when writes happen to it in one place, they get reflected in the other place. And <clears throat> people have been working on this for years, and there there weren't there weren't good solutions until Bitcoin came around. And how to do this in a in a setting where you don't trust the parties that are that are updating the database, right? So, you know, there 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 are algorithms that predate Bitcoin, like Paxos and PBFT. That that um, allow you to do this when uh, you you know the participants or there's a fixed set of participants. Maybe some of them can cheat, but there's a fixed set. Uh, Bitcoin was the first to do it in this like kind of wide open way where anybody can participate in the consensus, and yet the that people can still be sure that everyone's agreed on the same value, right? Um, and so this is this is what what a consensus algorithm is supposed to do is make it where you know. Uh, like everyone can agree what's in the, essentially the database, right? It's just agreeing on a value, right? Um, and so 
Bitcoin does it with this proof of work thing where everyone, you know, basically the, the, the chain with the longest amount of work dedicated to it is considered the, the, the source of truth. Uh, whereas uh, Professor David Mazaris uh, created this other algorithm, which we call Stellar Consensus Protocol, SCP. Uh, and the way it works is more similar to the prior consensus algorithms that are just message passing between the participants. Um, so what you have is you have like, so you have like several nodes in the system and each node says, hey, I will agree to this value as long as these other, other people in the network also, also agree to it. And what you can, you can show is that there, you can form what we call a transitive quorum over the whole set of nodes that are participating. And as long as there's sufficient overlap between all the nodes in the network, the, the whole network will agree to one value. Like if you don't have a sufficient overlap to say like there's a bunch of nodes in the US that, that are all connected to each other and there's a bunch of nodes in say Africa that are all connected together and there's no overlap, then of course these guys will diverge and, and think different things. But the same is true of any consensus of them. You really can't do better than that if people are not, are not talking to each other and not connected, right? So um, that's sort of a nutshell of how it works. Uh, if, if you want more details, uh, David has a good talk about it that's on our website. And there's also the white paper, of course, where you can go into the, the nitty gritty. But. Great. And uh, is there any anything about the particular architecture of the consensus out the consensus algorithm for Stellar that the audience might be able to learn from in terms of it being technically interesting to them that we can teach them? Yeah. Um, let's see. So, I mean, I think you know the consensus algorithm is super useful. I mean, I think the, what's more useful if you're building on top of the platform is the stuff that we've built on top of that, right? Like what the consensus algorithm is actually agreeing on. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you're if you're exploring like creating uh, like some like basically other people have taken SCP and used it. I think Mobilecoin is using it. There's a, there's a couple projects in Korea that are using it for for blockchains tailored for their specific use case that are that are not uh, built just for this uh, financial infrastructure. Um, and it might be useful if people want to do that, but that's pretty low level. I think probably the more accessible thing is is building on top of what we've already done, and then there's you know a whole host of things that you can build there. Uh, you know, we we don't have like full on uh, smart contracts like Ethereum does. It's not this Turing complete scripting language, but you can get pretty far. Uh, you can get you know basically you can do maybe I would say like ninety percent of the stuff you'd reasonably want to do. Um, but if you're doing something super complicated, then you would need some Turing complete language. But for most applications, you could you can use the kind of the the facilities that we have inside Stellar. So and and is is the the future plans to ever build such a Turing complete language or to provide more advanced capabilities? So I, so there's there's always this trade off between making your protocol uh, simple versus expressive. And the thing is, as you make it, uh, you know more and more complicated there's just a higher attack surface and like more things can go wrong and since what the use case we're targeting is this financial infrastructure we want to make sure that uh there's as little attack surface as possible that the thing is simple and understandable um <clears throat> you know we we you know there's been obviously like lots of uh you know missteps in, in the theorem world like the dow and all the like the parity hack and all these things and that's as a result of the thing being like super complicated right which you need for to do certain things but if you but <clears throat> i think there's this, uh, you know, um, there's this principle in, in computer science that you want to keep things as simple as possible to do the job, right? You want to build this, these these simple components, and and that's kind of the the thing that we're we're kind of trying to stick to. Um, what we're working on now is actually uh, this ability to do kind of sub networks because at some point uh, to reach scalability, we'll have to do different, we'll have to do things for like sharding and, and like sub networks and things like this. And it's possible that some of those will have more complete uh, scripting. They'll have like a Turing complete language, but I don't think the main net will ever have, uh, will ever, ever have stuff like that. So that makes sense. And can you give us a few examples of applications that folks have built using Stellar to inspire the audience about what they could build using Stellar? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think one of the interesting ones is there's a, uh, and basically the way coffee is harvested in, in like, you know, places all around the world now is super inefficient and, and kind of exploits the, the farmer. Um, and someone has built this machine that basically the, the coffee farmer can like dump their beans into this coffee machine and <clears throat> it basically grades the beans right there. And, uh, and then basically the farmer is giving a, given a token inside Stellar, like grade A beans or grade B beans. And then later when the beans are sold uh, at, at, at the, ultimate market, then the farmer is given some additional credit, whether whether they had grade A or grade B, what have you. Um, and this is different than the way it is now, where they just sell one lump sum. Uh, basically, the farmers just dump all their beans to the, this middleman, and the, they just give them one price. Because the problem is the, the, the ultimate price of the beans isn't determined until so much later date. And so uh, 
because you're able to like create these easy tokens on Stellar, these tokens kind of represent some future value of these beans, depending on what, what grade there are. And there's all kinds of things like that where you can, anything you can kind of like tokenize is like very, uh, is a very good application for, for Stellar. There's people doing things like carbon credits, uh, like, um, like bonds, uh, there, you know, there's things, there's all this like micro lending th stuff that people do where they can kind of tranche up people's loans and like resell them and things like this. There's all kinds of anything that you can tokenize is like a good, uh, use case for Stellar essentially. Mm -hmm. so, and so when, when you think about these projects that are building on top of Stellar that are, uh, that are actually using the Stellar network, it's using uh, Stellar Lumens as their backbone and as their infrastructure. And you compare that to these projects that are forking Stellar and are using Stellar's technology, but not necessarily benefiting the, the token itself and the ecosystem that you've already created. Uh, are, are you generally okay with, with those, those other approaches as well? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, everything we do is open source. Uh, it's, uh, SCP is, is sort of, I view as kind of this like, bedrock consensus algorithm. And of course you'd want to use that in lots of other applications. I mean, it doesn't make sense to try to like throw everything into this one network. Uh, you know, there's lots of different things you'd want to do with this consensus technology and, and uh, you know, trying to just, it just makes it bloated if you just try to shove every feature in there. Right. So it makes total sense that that something like mobile coin, for instance, that really has a totally different use case than what we're doing and we'll have different, uh, they'll have different trade-offs they want to make and they'll have different like features they want to first class in the, in the, in the protocol. Uh, it makes total sense that they would, they would do that. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. So uh, it, for us, we just like to see it be used. So that's great. I love it. It's very long-term uh, perspective. I really appreciate that. Um, and so tell us a little bit about what it was like in the early days at Stellar. So, you know, when you created Stellar, it was before the whole crypto craze happened, before investors started cashing in on, on all this. Uh, back then, it was a little bit more risky, I think, politically to make such a big bet on this technology. So what was it, what was it like for you and your team back in those early days? Um, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it, yeah, it was a totally different world. I mean, there was only a, a hand, like Ethereum hadn't even launched yet. There was only a handful of other, like, altcoins. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's been, it, it was kind of a long road there for a while because like I basically soon after we launched Stellar, there was kind of like a crypto winter where, you know, things kind of like, like there wasn't as much interest and obviously it picked up again a lot in 2017. And that just kind of put us in this different uh, level where now we have like, we were resource constrained for a very long time and, and, and now we're really not. Now we're just, you know, we're building, we're growing the team a lot and we're just able to do a lot more it, I think the chance of us achieving our vision is just much, much higher now, just because we're, there's just so much more interest in this space. So um, yeah, it's pretty exciting. So. Great to hear. Let's go to the audience for a few questions. Then we'll, then I'll ask you a few questions after that. So, sure. yeah. so we're opening up the ask a question tab. You can do this yourself, Jed, as well. Um, so the first question, I guess, is a question that I can answer, which is, are the sessions being recorded? Will they be available for later view? And the answer is yes. Uh, we are actually uh, recording all the sessions. They'll be available on Crowdcast as well as on YouTube for your consumption. And so uh, it, it's all free and available for everyone. So hopefully, even if you miss a session, it's no big deal. You can watch it later. The only trade-off is you won't be able to actually ask the audience a question or get polled as part of our asking you questions. Speaking of which, Jed, if there's any questions that you want to ask the audience, we can do that as part of this. So if you want to have sure. fun and, and ask them stuff about them and Stellar, you could start thinking about anything you want to ask them. So the next question, uh, do you want to maybe tackle this one? It's, it's what are the use cases? What are the uses of blockchain other than cryptocurrencies? Um, the uses of blockchain other than cryptocurrencies. Um, yeah, I think one of uh, the one that I, I think is most viable is uh, basically tracking um, equity. So basically, I think the way the way you know stocks work now, it's it's also pretty archaic and broken, and really hasn't kept up with the internet. Um, so it, I would imagine like in, you know, the other 10 years, I think most companies, most private companies will issue some sort of tokenized version of their equity rather than paper. Uh, and this will provide like kind of an instant secondary market. It, it allows like liquidity to like, and, and source of funding from like lots of different, uh, geographies. Like right now it's, it's, you know, you're in a much better position raising money in Silicon Valley than you are in say like Chile, you know? Um, and, and. You know, this is another this is another aspect of how this kind of technology just kind of flattened, like levels of playing field and, and makes everything more connected and, and much fairer, frankly. So um, so I'm pretty excited about that one. Uh, th there's obviously like lots of stuff batted around for like how this stuff will change things. Um, I think a lot of the use cases are actually better suited for a centralized solution. I mean, there's really a there's really a, um, 
there's a big price to pay for making your, your application decentralized. So you need to make sure that it's worth, worth it to pay that price. For some things, it makes total sense, like currencies and I think these, this equity uh, use case. And there's a lot of other tokens that will fit that as well. Uh, but, but you know, some things I think will ultimately need to be centralized, essentially. So uh, That's great. Next question. Uh, I, I love this question, by the way, um, which is any thoughts on challenges for organizations looking to tap into a limited talent supply within the blockchain ecosystem? So basically what they're asking there is there just aren't blockchain engineers that are available for hire yeah. because no one has the experience. How do we actually create a, a positive success rate in this area given that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a little bit of a um, uh, a myth that you need to hire some like blockchain engineer. I mean, I, almost none of the people that we hire have like previous experience with the uh, blockchain stuff. I mean, it's just if you're a, a good programmer, you can figure this stuff out. It's not really complicated. And most of the stuff that, most of the most of the places where people are doing the engineering and all the programming work is kind of this level above the actual consensus algorithm. So it's it's not that different than like, for instance, if you're building stuff on seller, it's not that different than like programming against like normal web technologies, right? So you you know finding pro good programmers in general is super hard. So um, so that's always going to be painful. But I mean, they're obviously in, in, there's tons of demand there, but but it's not like you need to find someone with like tons of blockchain experience. I mean, they, that, that's that's a mistake, I think. So. I agree with you on that. In fact, for my all the startups that I've run, we've always tried to hire folks that have ability over experience because yeah. the theory here is you wait six months and you hire someone with a great ability. Six months later, they will have the experience you're looking for, plus they'll have great ability. Whereas you yeah. hire someone who has a lot of experience without a lot of ability, six months later, you've got a, lot, a guy with experience without ability. Right. So, yeah, so yeah. I totally agree with you. And the second part of his question here was, um, is there any specific skill set or industry experience that could be beneficial uh, that you might look for or might benefit an engineer when getting into blockchain? Um, I mean, uh, yeah, again, like I think it's just general uh, like programming aptitude, right? Like having, you know, you've, in general, it's good for you as a programmer to learn several languages. It's good for you to work in like different technology stacks just so you have familiarity with what's out there and like what other people have tried. And it's the same thing here, right? So it's like, you know, there's, there's no like magic bit, uh, blockchain thing. Right. So uh, it, it's just, just the same skills that you would for any other programmer, I think. So that's fair. Okay. We'll come back to audience questions in just a second. So keep asking questions, audience. We'll return to you in just a minute here. Um, so let's see. So I noticed um, that the, the plan for stellar is to give away a hundred billion uh, lumens over time. And that seems very generous that you're giving away the majority of your lumens. Well, Tell me 95 more. Billion, but yeah. 95 billion, sorry, 95 <laughs> yeah. billion. Uh, yeah, I rounded up there. Um, yeah. Why Why did you just decide to be so generous? And what is kind of your thought process and strategy behind that? How did you think about, about that approach? Well, so, so the idea is that, again, we're, we're trying to build this internet level protocol that we want pretty much to be this ubiquitous thing. Like for instance, you know, when you're setting up a mail server or a web page or whatever, you don't think about what protocol to use. You just use HTTP or SMTP, whatever, right? Um, and, and we want it to be the case here as well. Like when you're going to send international payments, you just naturally use the internet standard for sending international payments, which is Stellar, right? And the way to achieve ubiquity and, and uh, adoption is just, I, I think one of one of the good things that can benefit that is just getting it, the, the underlying currency in the hands of lots and lots of people, right? And so that's kind of the idea behind that. Like it's actually, uh, you know, it's it's uh, altruistic on one hand because we're giving out a lot of it, but like ultimately I think it, it it's what leads to success of the project. I think hoarding it is very just short-sighted. You, you won't... Uh, you won't you won't achieve success like ho hoarding a bunch of stuff that's worth zero is is not is worse than you know giving away 95 percent of something that's worth a lot right so um so that that's kind of the idea behind it i mean i think i think we just we want we want this to be widely adopted and and we think that we also think that the people that are a lot of you know we're giving this away in lots of different ways like one of those through this like partnership grant program so the people that are the companies and stuff that are like filling out the ecosystem can also participate and essentially be like aligned with our mission as well and i think i think that's important and fair so mm -hmm. that's fair and i also noticed that you have an inflation rate that's kind of built into stellar about one percent yep. per year tell us a little bit about that and the philosophy behind that inflation yeah i mean the idea is that i mean like some economists will argue that if you i mean one, one of them so one of the earlier uh, like criticism of Bitcoin, I guess, was that it's deflationary, and economists really would would you know have a lot of problems with that. That it like leads to this uh, you know this deflationary spiral that's super bad. 
I mean, I think this doesn't really apply because there's lots of other currencies in the world, but, but just in, you know, uh, but just to address it is one of the reasons that we put the small inflation. I think the ideal state is that there's this small fixed inflation that people know about, but it's not, it's not at the whim of like some central bank, but, but it's still going up like to make, you know, to address the fact that like coins are lost and like there's new people joining the network. And it also kind of corrects the initial distribution of coins. Like say we, you know, say we didn't do it in the most fair way or the most correct way over time that those, those effects get uh, reduced just because new coins are coming into the system by this inflation mechanism. So th those are kind of the thoughts. behind. It. And what I love about the model is that since it's only 1%, it doesn't really materially affect your holdings. So it's not like, no, it doesn't really matter. And then people have actually built all these uh, inflation pools now where you can kind of point your point your, because the way it works is you, you vote for where you want your, your share of the inflation to go. And you have to have over a certain threshold to, to, to receive the, the inflation. Um, and people have created these inflation pools where people point their inflation at these pools and then just redistribute to the people. So, it, it, you know, if you, if you don't want to point it at somebody else, then, then you can kind of reap your own inflation back. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Let's go to back to the audience for a few questions and we'll just go through the, the most highly upvoted questions first. Okay. Uh, so the first question, how does one create their own blockchain? This is a fairly broad <laughs> question. So I'll let you answer it in the way that you see fit. Um, I, so, I think you like at this point. There's lots of technology out there, and there's there's uh, lots of good protocols. I, I think you should be very careful about wanting to create a new thing. Uh, just, um, I mean, that's always true in computer science. Like, just do a survey of what's out there and make sure there's nothing you can use. I mean, most of these projects are open source, so there's probably something you can use that that's solid uh, that you can just take and like modify however you're wanting to to do it. Um, yeah, I mean, creating a whole new consensus algorithm is is very hard. Uh, you know that, like, like I said, like people working on this problem for years, and they didn't even really think it was solvable until Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin solved it, that allowed people to start thinking, well, okay, this is solvable. What are some other ways? And there's only maybe a two or three that that are that have solved it besides Bitcoin. Uh, and you know, it's it's uh, I don't know, it's hard to, to make a new consensus argument at least. So, yeah, great answer. Next question: Will Stellar be acquiring Chain? Is this something you can speak on? Uh. I can't really speak about that. SDF is not requiring chain. That that's false. But uh, you know, obviously, there's other entities involved. But fair enough. Next question: What are the current major projects based on blockchain? So I guess this would be maybe from an audience member that's curious about case studies that might be useful for him within his organization. Yeah. Um, so I mean, that's one of the one of the things about blockchain that's so interesting to me is there's been so much attention, so much hype, uh, but there's been very little actual done with it, right? They're, everything is still very nascent. Uh, you know, I think that the, the hype is just way preceding the reality. Um, and uh, which is somewhat inf unfortunate, but maybe that's kind of the nature of the beast. Um, some of the real things are, uh, you know, like the coffee thing that I just mentioned, there's, there's, uh, we have like several partners that are using it as remittance uh, for remittance payments, like you know, from Europe to the Philippines and Europe to Africa. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of other projects in the works, but there's like, again, there's like very little uh, actual user activity with it. It's been pretty speculative to date. So. Yeah, I, that's what I've noticed as well. In fact, I, it's funny because, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, when I generally build product myself, I look to solve a problem in the world and I try to avoid building a solution before there's a problem to solve. And in, right. in the blockchain, it's kind of a mix where we have some ideas for some of the problems in the world that could be solved with blockchain, but there's also some speculation about those future problems. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of cart before the horse kind of stuff. I mean, some some things are you know are, are pretty grounded and and trying to solve real things, but it's it's a long process. I mean, one of the things about blockchain is it's naturally going to be long, just because what you're trying to build is a network. These things are almost always only useful if you can get network effects, and uh, trying to build network effects are super hard. In the beginning, it works really against you. If you don't have the network, it's your thing is essentially useless, right? You have to like sell this vision. I mean, once you get over that hump and then like lots of people are on your platform, then the network effects are working for you and it's a different story. But but getting to that stage is, is super hard and obviously it takes a long time. So I think I think that's kind of what the dynamic we're seeing. So mm -hmm. That's great. So let, let's, let's pivot a little bit to talk about some uh, kind of technical blockchain topics that developers might benefit from. So um, so let's say I'm a developer in the audience. I'm, I'm considering embracing blockchain. I'm thinking about building on, on top of Stellar. Um, what is it like to build a blockchain application? Is it more challenging than to build a traditional cloud-based application, given that it's decentralized? How do you debug it? 
uh, what, what are some best practices in terms of, of how to approach building those applications? Anything you can speak to there might be beneficial right. to the audience. Um, I, I don't know. That it's not necessarily harder. It depends, obviously, it depends on what you're trying to do. I and mean, this is, you know, a pretty abstract question, but uh, it, 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 it shouldn't be harder. But it is often a different paradigm where you have to think, well, um, you, you know, I think the best the best uses of, of some sort of blockchain type technology is that you're taking advantage of the fact that you have this kind of uh, um, shared, untrusted resource. Uh, and and that's not the way most things are built today. So so it does take that kind of this shift in thinking, but I don't think it's necessarily hard once you make that, that shift. I mean, um, you know, at least for us, like, there's a, it's a normal like REST API that you're using. There's an SDK and like all the different languages. So you can, you know, program against this thing. So all that stuff is pretty straightforward. You just have to be a little bit creative because of, uh, of what you can possibly do, because it does change that or like what's actually useful in this context, which wasn't uh, possible or, or it's not useful in another, right? So th those are kind of the, the harder things. Mm -hmm. so. And let's say, let's say some, you know, some aspiring entrepreneurs in the audience decide to build a blockchain project. Um, and let's say their team is distributed all over the world, like similar to a foundation, like you might have at Stellar. Um, how do you manage and motivate a team like this? How do you keep them excited given that the team is geographically distributed? You can't see each other, have water cooler conversations yeah. every day. How have you guys? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's obviously not unique to blockchain stuff. I mean, any mm -hmm. kind of distributed team is going to have these same challenges. I mean, I think uh, you know, we're probably about, uh, I don't know, 35% distributed or 40% distributed. Uh, and I mean, we do most of our communication in Slack. We use like shared Google Docs. We, we try to, you know, we still manage to have like a weekly team meeting where we can see each other's faces uh, at least once a week. And and the main thing is making sure most of your communication doesn't happen just in office, but but uh, um, you know it's written down somewhere, it, like it, so other people can see it that are that are offline. You know, um, which is why Google Docs is great because it's this collaborative environment where you know you can kind of see what other people are thinking and then make comments, and it's more async, so that's for that you know can be good for different time zones. Uh, but, but it also takes a certain type of person. I mean, there's definitely some people that we've brought in the organization that are just not good at working remote. Like they need that motivation of being with, around other people or, you know, and then some people are just much better at it because that that's, you know, like for me personally, like if I could just work in my house alone, I would get way more done than being in an office, right? So uh, some people are like that and that you kind of need to skew that way. You need, you need to get people in your organization that are, that are more self-motivated essentially. So. Mm -hmm. And have you ever had the situation where you have external contributors to Stellar who are not working for your organization and in a democratic way, they, they want to make these contributions, but their ideas might not be the best or they might be misguided or you might not agree with those ideas. Yes. <laughs> but, but, but as a leader of Stellar, it is your job and your role to set an example and to empower the community to feel like their contributions and their words are heard by you that way they, yeah. they're excited to contribute so how do you balance those two yeah i mean it's it's uh you know it's it's a people problem right it's not there's no simple answer it's you know that there's there's a spectrum of people trying to contribute to the project and you know some of them are great and you can just like accept their pull requests some need tons of feedback you know um but but you're right you don't want to discourage people you, you want to you know you you want to find the places where they they can contribute because I, I believe like anyone even if you're not a programmer can contribute to the project i mean this is one of the things that's made bitcoin so popular and great is because it's been this huge collaborative effort and by people who are, definitely have no programming skills right so um you just need to be able to like kind of shepherd people in the right right directions and 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 you know encourage them but but make sure it doesn't it's not sucking up all your time we're trying to get better at that uh you know we've had pretty small bandwidth over the last few years, but we're kind of bringing, we're like right now we've, we've just got someone that's going to help with like developer evangelism and de developer relations essentially. And then that person will help that process a lot. So, um, so we're excited about that kind of thing. So. And how, how is the decision made for how, how an improvement gets accepted within Stellar? Um, it, it's sort of, uh, it, de it depends on where in the stack, uh, for Stellar core, there's, there's probably, and it also depends on how low level it is in Stellar Core. Like if it's just fixing the software, you know, obviously if it's fixing some bug, we'll look at it, just do normal like code review. Uh, and if it looks good, then one of us will sign off on it. If it's some protocol change and we have we have a GitHub repo where we discuss the protocol changes and it kind of, we go back and forth. And once there's kind of consensus among, uh, you know, among like myself, Dave Mazeros, Nicola, our CTO, and like a few other people, then then we'll we'll pull it in. Um, but yeah, it's basically you, you kind of just 
talk about it and convince people that it's the right change to make. And all of these things have trade-offs, like I was saying before. I mean, every change of the protocol has like, you know, you're making, you're either making it more complicated or you're like changing this one thing. There's always trade-offs. So that it's never like this very simple thing. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's fair. Any questions you want to ask the audience before we go to questions that the audience have asked? Like maybe anything um, you're wondering where, where about. Where do I see the answers in this? Uh, uh, so you click yeah. on polls on the bottom and you can just click okay. create a poll and you can ask the audience anything you want to with a multiple choice answer in case you want to learn about our audience. Okay. Uh, let me see. Um, I don't see the polls thing. I mean, I guess I'm curious like what, oh, I can what create it people are most excited about. Like what, what, what people... Like, well, I guess where, where do people even learn about these things? I, that, I'm so curious, like, like, I just feel like there's so many garbage cryptocurrency projects in, in this industry and I just don't know where people get this information. I just, mm -hmm. So I we could ask like a multiple question. choice answer. So maybe, yeah. uh, are there a few ways that you think might people might get their information? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Well, we'll just go, we'll just go on. I'll, 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 I'll ask a, a form of that, which is yeah. where, where, where did you learn about blockchain development, right? And answer number one will be self-taught, right? Uh, or, or not where do they learn about it, but where, where, do they, where do they learn more about it, actually? Because, like, everyone just, like, hears it from a friend or whatever, but, like, where do they actually, like, go and, like, learn about these things? Yeah. Well, so how about self-taught look at code? Maybe another one will be, like, Stack Overflow. Um, how about blog posts or books? Maybe could be other answers. Um, maybe example applications. Any other answers you can think of? Um, I don't know. How about how about a like, presentation like yeah, talks like yours? Yeah, sure. Great. That should be enough. Let's see what the audience says. All right, while those while those answers come in, um, you can see them in real time. By the way, on, on the polls section. Um, so it looks like most okay. people so far are self-taught, and they, they just looked at code. Yeah. And number two, by far, is blog posts. That's cool. Hmm. Looks like there aren't, aren't enough books yet on blockchain, so not that many people learning from that. Right, right. <laughs> cool. Uh, great. So a few other questions for me. So you have this new initiative called Lightyear. Tell us what, what is Lightyear, and uh, how does that compare to Stellar? Yeah, so uh, so basically there's we started Stellar Development Foundation, SDF, uh, a little over four years ago now. Uh, we set it up as a nonprofit. Uh, and the idea was to eventually be like Linux Foundation, essentially, where you're kind of like, um, you know, uh, making sure that progress continues on the code. And also the other big side of it was to distribute these lumens. Um, but we kind of, as, as the network started to gain traction, we realized that there was this huge need for, for, um, for some, something more like Red Hat, where it's like providing services and support. Uh, to these companies and financial institutions. And SDF is really not set up to do that. And we didn't really want to kind of like twist what it was doing to, to handle that. So uh, so we set up this separate company. It's, there's very little relation between it and SDF actually right now. Um, I, I work at both, but everyone else works at one or the other. Um, and uh, the idea being, again, like it just, it's more of, you can think of it as like the commercial facing like it's sort of like consensus is for Ethereum or, or like Red Hat for, for Linux, where it, 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 it's more of a sales organization and like does more of the client facing work for people. Uh, because inevitably when we would talk to a financial institution about, Hey, you should use Stellar. It's great. They would need somebody to help them with like, like integrating or like ongoing support. And again, SEF wasn't really set up to do that. So Lightyear has been created to, to serve that function. And how do you how do you divide and conquer what goes into Lightyear and what goes into Stellar? Um, it, it's it's uh, pretty straightforward. I mean, like all so all core development uh, stays in SDF. Uh, all the all the the Lumen distribution is in SDF. Um, you know, working on working on Horizon, which is kind of the REST API for the network, is in SDF. And and Lightyear is all the partnership activity. So we have like you know uh, people who are doing like business development essentially and like integrations. Uh, so those those kind of engineers go over there. We we just launched uh, this, or we just announced this application, Stellar X, which is uh, a front end for our distributed exchange uh, for the Stellar distributed exchange. So it kind of will look like you know Polonix or Kraken or something. But you're instead of using instead of the back end being a database, the back end is the Stellar network. So you can it's just a nice way to use this distributed exchange, which would be pretty cool. And that's made by uh, uh, by Lightyear. Um, so all those kind of applications will fall under Lightyear and, and SDF will do kind of like the low, lower level stuff. Okay, and tell me more about what you would use Stellar X for. Tell us more about that project. 
Um, yeah, so it's uh, so like I said, like st the way uh, what Stellar is is it's uh, essentially you not not only does it have like the native currency, the lumens, but it, you can put any other kind of asset in it. So you can put dollars or euros, or you can put you can create all these tokens, like all, all these kind of like ICO projects that people uh, were making in 2017. Like most of those can be created on on Stellar, and the, then you have like you have you know, these random tokens in there. And uh, the cool thing is, is inside the Stellar protocol, there's a way to exchange these things. There's a way to swap dollars for Moby coin, or there's a way to swap, you know, euros for, uh, you know, um, carbon credits, right? So uh, Stellar X is an interface for that. It's like a browser for our exchange. So it, 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 you know, allows you to like have a wallet where you're holding these different tokens and you can trade them, you know, has graphs for, uh, you know, just like a normal, like Kraken or like, you know, Bitrex or any of these exchanges are kind of the front end looks kind of like those, though I think a little bit better, but, but, uh, uh, and so like for a normal user, maybe they won't even realize they're using a distributed exchange. They'll just think they're using a normal central thing, but, but it should be a, a bit better. So. And, and is it both decentralized as well as distributed? So, so it itself, it, so it's just a web application, right? Uh, it's sort of like a web browser, right? But rather than hit a, a web server, it's hitting the stellar network. So, the, to the extent that the you know so so basically seller network is distributed and decentralized so all the all the actual activity the, the trading and stuff is happening in the seller network this is just a view of it right it's just kind of like a, a, a viewer for the for the network so that makes, that makes sense and so yeah. would this be an alternative to something like zero x or uh, some of the other uh, uh, yeah. changes yeah mm -hmm. makes yeah. sense great um let's see here so a few other questions um so in terms of kind of uh the future and where you think this whole industry is going. Let's say Stellar continues to be successful and Lightyear continues to be successful. Where do you think uh, traditional financial institutions like SWIFT, which does uh, wire transfers, as well as Western Union and MoneyGram, which is responsible for remittance payments, how do, how do you see those organizations existing in the future? Do they still serve a role or do they get replaced by projects like Stellar and the associated projects around Lightyear? Yeah, so I mean, I think um, so. Uh, I think there'll always be a role for institutions like that. I, I think you know, just like um, basically, at least in the Stellar case, like Stellar is just this low-level protocol, right? You still need some. You, know, you still need people. Like Western Union uh, has tons of payout places. They have like where people want to go and pick up cash, right, or, or give cash, right? And none of these these blockchain projects are going to take that away, right? People still want to use cash at a lot of places, right? So uh, there needs to be some like physical location uh, and there needs to be some wallet that people are using and interacting with. There needs to be some nice UI. And, you know, I hope that these things adopt and use the Stellar Rail, uh, you know, like I hope, uh, I hope Western Union or MoneyGram, they start using the Stellar Rail underneath and they should, like it, it increases the, you know, the reach of their network. Um, but, you know, uh, but they're, but even if they don't, someone else will. I think. I think the the analogy to make is kind of like the internet. Like the internet, you know, there were tons and tons of bookstores before the internet. The internet came along. It didn't remove. It didn't kill bookstores. It just made it where there's one bookstore now. The one bookstore that chose to like leverage the or to use like the leverage and scale of the internet uh, became the dominant one, right? And I think it's the same is true here. The one of these financial institutions or the handful of these financial institutions that kind of get this stuff and uh, start, uh, you know, using it to its to its maximum effect will, will be, become the dominant one because you know th what the internet gives you is leverage and scale and that's what these that's something like stellar does as well it gives you like tons and tons of leverage tons of scale where you you, you one it's potentially possible that one financial institution could like kind of dominate the market right um and i think that's what we'll see essentially makes sense and uh you know on that same related subject uh you know with your decentralized slash distributed exchange that you're creating do you think that as as liquidity is built up in these exchanges, do you think that there are network effects that happen there where it can become a winner take all market with these exchanges as well? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, it, you know traders need to go, and they always do go where there's more liquidity, right? So if you can get a lot of liquidity in whatever exchange, people are kind of uh, stuck using it, right? So I mean, this is one of the reasons why. Mt. Gox existed for so long is because it had so much liquidity. Like people saw the writing on the wall that it was like not being well run, but people st still traded there because it had all the liquidity, right? And it was it, it had it was only until there was like a, a huge disasters that people started trading other places, right? So uh, yeah, there, there's huge network effects in liquidity. 
Uh, and that's one of our challenges is to make sure that there's enough liquidity inside the, the distributed exchange inside Stellar. And if we can kind of achieve that, then people will naturally just start trading there because it is a better platform for that. So Makes sense. Yeah. Let's go back to the audience, get a few more audience questions here. So the uh, number one question is Ethereum versus Hyperledger. Do you have any opinions on that? Um, uh, I don't know. They're, they're very different. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, as far as I understand, Hyperledger is this uh, permissioned chain that's like only between like a, a set number of like financial people and Ethereum is obviously this big public network. Uh, they're trying to solve two very different things. Um, yeah. Okay. Fair enough. And then next question, uh, why do you create centralized companies if you're passionate about decentralization? Um, like what is the, what is the political purpose, for example, behind, um, light year, uh, I guess would be one rephrasing of that question, for example. Yeah. I mean, the thing is like, I mean, you have to be practical, right? Like there's like in order to, you know, the internet for instance is this huge decentralized thing, right? But there's plenty of centralized companies that, that leverage it and build it and, and kind of were essential for it being uh, why they adopted, right? Um, if you don't have, uh, you need people building the ecosystem, right? And those are just better done by a centralized thing. Like it's just more efficient to do it that way, right? So um, although I do, I don't want Lightyear to be the only company doing this. I don't want... You know, I don't want SDF to be the only company that's like, you know, interested in the seller's success. Uh, but you have to have, you have to have like a kernel of these things to, to start the start the process, right? Um, and it, it's just it's just the way the world is essentially, right? I mean, I think the important thing is that you want you don't want any of these to be a privileged actor. You don't want them like the network shouldn't like contribute some amount of money back to one of these things naturally or automatically, things like that, or they shouldn't have special privileges where they can all of a sudden, you know, take money from someone's account or anything like that. Like they shouldn't be a privileged actor. They should kind of be on the same playing field as everyone else. Uh, their advantage should just come from being the ones that are most interested in it and, and the ones that are like most dedicated to it essentially. Right. So um, that that's kind of my philosophy on all this stuff is that you, you, what you want is a level playing field, like some playing field where anyone can play, but you don't want to say like no central, actor can play on this thing because then no one will adopt it. Right. So that, that's kind of the, it's a very crazy. practical approach. So. I'm going to skip down a little bit because there's a question that kind of caught my eye that I think we should talk about, which is uh, asked by Andre Rogers, which is that blockchain can be used and implemented to solve problems in almost everything. Um, what are features of a problem that make it a good use case for blockchain? So that, yeah, that's a really that, good question, I think. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, yeah, because like I was saying earlier, I mean, people are throwing blockchain at everything, but but really you should ask yourself, you know, does this problem actually have the, the, the characteristics that you need a blockchain for? And, the, and the, the main thing is that you have a set of participants that don't necessarily know each other or don't don't maybe don't trust each other uh, that still want to be able to transact, right? And that transaction can be anything financial or any other kind of transaction, right? Just Just they want to be able to deal with each other. And that's when you need, uh, or that's when a, a system like a blockchain is like very helpful, right? Because again, what it gives you is it gives you this public public place where people can write data to, uh, but no one can change arbitrarily. So it gives you kind of this built-in trusted third party that 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 is uh, you know verified by the whole network, right? And um, you know, there's there's a lot of cases where you need that, but there's a lot of cases where you don't. And what you should be careful for with about is that. Uh, a lot of a lot of the places where people are using blockchain, there's still some third party out there, like some you know some state or some something else that, that has to verify everything, and so you, you still have some trusted party at the end of the day. And if that's true, then just use a central database, right? There's no reason there's no reason to have this go through all these hoops of, of making this decentralized thing. If it, at the end of the day you still have to go back to this this uh, central entity, right? So that's fair. Uh, next question that kind of caught my eye was asked by Prashant Chadhari. Sorry for butchering your name there. Um, and this is a good question too, which is as a blockchain developer, which language do you suggest to learn for beginners as well as mid-level developers? Uh, a programming language which will also be helpful in the future. So the reason why I thought this was an interesting question is because a lot of developers out there, they can't pick every language, right? They can't be fully polyglot. They kind of have to pick their battles and make their bets in the world. And from a practical perspective, you know, that's what kind of gets them ahead in their careers. So what, what's your projections and your predictions for, for them? Yeah, um, I mean, it, it depends on what level of the stack you're working at. Um, I, I think Go is a, probably a pretty good choice. Uh, you know, we do, like for us, Stellar Core is written in C++. Everything above that basically is written either Go or JavaScript if it's the front end. Um, and, you know, there's obviously like a lot of Ethereum stuff written in Go. Uh, it, it seems like it's a it's it's sort of like taking over from Python in terms of like the, the web development language of choice. So uh, I, I think that 
or the back end language of choice. And I think that's a, I think it would be a good bet. Um, yeah, obviously JavaScript is always pretty useful for doing any front end stuff, whether it's using the blockchain as the back end or not. Um, those would be my two first recommendations, I guess. Great. And then Randolph jo Joseph asks, there are five major agreed upon known identity issues that blockchain will not solve. What other proposed solutions? Are you familiar with what he's referring to there? Yeah, I mean, I, I've uh, people often use like blockchain as a solution to identity. I, I don't really see it. I haven't really heard of a good blockchain solution that involves identity. Uh, usually, for identity, you need some state to say that 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 person is who they are. Like, you know, you have your driver's license issued by some some government, right? Or you have your passports issued by some government. And again, that's going back to the thing where there is some central entity, so just use that. They should just have a database. They probably need better APIs around their identity, things like this. But uh, you know, but I, again, I haven't looked too closely in like how, you know, the identity solutions for that involve blockchain. I mean, maybe there are some clever situations out there. Um, I'm, I just haven't, I'm not an expert in it or haven't really looked at it. So. That's great. And then there's a few questions about kind of IBM and their relationship with Stellar. Maybe you could give some insight as to kind of how your organizations are working together and, and how that is expected to unfold in the future. Yeah. Um, so, uh, our, our, yeah, we have a really great partnership with IBM. Basically, they, you know, they have relationships with almost every bank on the planet, uh, and they uh, they see that there's this huge opportunity to to uh, kind of get those banks using um, some some like global payment system that's that's not SWIFT and 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 has a lot of better features, right? And uh, for us, like, we don't want to go and sell it to banks because it's you know a huge. Uh, it's, it takes a lot of time and you, it takes a lot of relationships that we don't have. And uh, it, it can basically, for, for small companies, uh, selling to these huge enterprises can basically kill your company because it, it, it just sucks up all your time and it gets, keeps getting pushed out now and now. So it's a perfect relationship where IBM can go and, and manage, those, uh, manage those deals with banks and like consortiums of banks and things like this and other, and other financial institutions like that. Uh, and we can provide them support. Uh, because obviously, you know, if they're if they're going to if Stellar's going to be part of this solution for them, then uh, you know they'll, they'll need to talk to us, um, you know, to help them through. Um, and so it's kind of like this symbiosis, really, where, where uh, there's essentially you can kind of think of them as sort of like Lightyear, but but at a, at a different tier, right? So, yeah, that's great. Well, thank you for audience for those questions. We'll go to the last few set of questions with Jed before we conclude for today. Um, so, what this is kind of a broad question, but I'd love to hear kind of your thoughts on it in terms of when you just kind of look at the ecosystem in general, even beyond Stellar, what are some of the bigger challenges that you're seeing facing blockchain today? And and kind of how do you think that that we may be solving those in the coming years? Like what what's top of mind as a concern for you when you look at the ecosystem these days? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the biggest thing for certainly is uh, how do you scale this stuff, right? Because again, like I was saying, like the hype is way preceding the reality. Like if any of these systems kind of... Uh, if, if they were like turned on today, essentially like, you know, if a billion people started using any of these things, it would just crush them, right? They, they just, they don't scale the way that uh, people are hoping. And and so that's that's the main technical challenge right now is just how, how to get these to scale, right? And so um, th that's all we're working on basically right now. And uh, I think, you know, Ethereum as well is working on a bunch of things like scalability uh, fixes. Um, and, and that's certainly uh, the big challenge, right? So. And where, what is the current state of scalability today with, Ethereum, with, uh, with Stellar? Um, so, I mean, that's, it, it depends on the axis, but, but you could probably get to about 500 transactions per second. Uh, you know, it would, I would think that you could get to like a couple hundred users or a couple hundred million users. Um, yeah, probably around there before you'd start having like some issues or it, the thing is, it's all, it's very vague because you can always throw bigger hardware at it, you know, but then that limits the amount of people that can run the, the validators, like if, if you were throwing like as big as boxes as you could get, then you could push that much further. But we obviously want more than just like the largest companies in the world to be able to run this thing. So, um, so it's a little, it's, there's not really a clean answer. Um, there's a lot of stuff we're doing now. We're implementing lightning networks. We're working on some sharding thing. We're like making just a bunch of improvements to the code to make it much, much faster. Um, so we, we hope by like, you know, this point next year, we'll, we'll be in a much better place. So. Oh, that's great. So about a, a one-year timetable to implement a lot of this. Yeah. That's great. And w what advice would you give to aspiring blockchain engineers in the audience, you know, like in general about, about their careers and about blockchain? Is there any kind of wisdom that you've learned over the years that might be helpful for them to hear? Um, I mean, there's, 
basically it's, it's, you know, I mean, at least the way I learned to program is just, you just start doing things, right? Like you, you, you think of some problem you want to solve and then you just go and, and, and start doing it. Right. Programming is a very like, uh, practical hands-on, uh, exercise it's it's a, it's a craft right it's it's not it's not uh like physics it's it's something that you you know you know you've got to sink your teeth in and right and start doing it so i think that's the best advice is just start doing it whether it's a blockchain thing or not and and if you are going to do a blockchain thing or if you're going to go work for some blockchain company just really try to make sure that their business model makes sense because i, I like again like i think 90 percent, 95 percent of these things just don't actually make sense from like uh, the business model doesn't make sense right so just uh, you know you, uh, if you, if you're a programmer, especially if you're a good programmer, your opportunity, uh, your, your, your opportunity is just really vast. So where you point your, your time is like super critical and just, and just try to try to take your time figuring out where you're going to do that because it's, it has a lot of impact. Like it, it's, it can be get something that just kind of fizzles out to something that's like amazing. Right. And, and you'll have a big impact on that. So that's great. And are there any, any like kind of first steps that you might recommend? For engineers who are curious about Stellar, who want to start building on top of Stellar, um, sure. Yeah, let me post this link um, here. So th this is this is a link to our uh, our build challenge. Um, so basically, it's just this this uh, contest we have or program we have that basically goes every three months. We give people awards like Lumen awards. It's one of the ways we're distributing the Lumens out to the world to people who are kind of like building in the ecosystem. So if you take a look at that, that has like links and like some example projects that you could possibly build. Um, and, uh, yeah. And then ho hopefully you could create something and, you know, enter and like talk to the other, other participants and, and uh, get some ideas. So, right. Well, did any, any last thoughts or, um, anything else you want to say before we conclude for today? Um, no, that's it. I mean, hopefully, yeah. If you want to learn more about seller, uh, you know, you, we have a public Slack, you can jump into slack.seller.org. Uh, our Reddit is, is pretty active, you know, you get there and talk to people. Uh, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully we see some seller projects because uh, we definitely want to build the ecosystem. Great. Thanks. I'll tell you just from my firsthand experience, you know, as an investor in San Francisco, I've seen uh, a number of startups building on top of Stellar just, just coincidentally through per firsthand experience. And I've been, I, I was shocked when I saw that I bought a lot more Stellar when I saw that. By the way. <laughs> yeah. The ecosystem's really gone a lot. I mean, we've been this last like year, six months has been, has been pretty great for us. So yeah, mm -hmm. we're pretty excited. Yeah, there's so. a lot of momentum. Well, thank yeah. you so much, Jed. You know, we're we really, really privileged to have your time today. And, uh, you know, we're inspired by everything you've created. You've done a tremendous service to the industry by forwarding the industry. And so thanks for that. Yeah, and, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And audience, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes with Brian Fox. Brian Fox is the co-founder of the ORCID protocol, which is solving for government surveillance and censorship on the internet through a new privacy layer. So we'll learn about that in just a few minutes. Jed, yeah, thanks again. Yeah, all right. See you guys. Okay, take care. Bye.